my name is Sav Rogers, and I'm so excited to be hosting this conversation today regarding changing the game as part of Pride Grass, uh, a collaboration between the Tallgrass Film Festival and the Transgender Film Center. My name is Sav Rogers. I'm the executive director of the Trans Film Center, and I'm also a Tallgrass alumnus. And I'm so excited to introduce Alex Schmitter, producer of Changing the Game, to join us for a conversation around his brilliant film. Alex, you there? Hey, Sav. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here with Tall Grass, and thank you for uh, sharing the film and having this conversation with me. It's such a pleasure to get to talk to you anytime, whether we're live on Facebook and YouTube or, or not. So uh, this is an especially uh, cool thing for me because I admire you so much as a creative and as a producer and as a consultant and somebody who makes it easier for people like me and like other trans filmmakers to go out and tell their stories in an effective way. And so I'm really excited to do a deep dive with you today about not only changing the game, but your career thus far. I'm super excited and a big fan of yours as well, Sav, as you know. Just a big love fest over here at yeah, Tallgrass. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, for the uninitiated, perhaps there are people who are watching this who haven't seen Changing the Game yet. Can you describe briefly what the film is and you know how you got involved in it? Yeah, so Changing the Game is now available to stream on Hulu as of June 1st. And it is about three high school athletes who happen to be transgender. Um, there's Mac Beggs, who's a wrestler out of Texas. Andrea Yearwood, who is uh, a track runner out of Connecticut, and Sarah Rose Huckman, who is a Nordic skier in New Hampshire. And it's really just all about their everyday lives and the struggles that they have to go through just to be themselves as transgender teens uh, to play the sports that they love. But, you know, I think um, what initially drew me to the film was a bit of a surprise. Um, I was approached about four and a half years ago. I was working at GLAD at the time and I got a cold call from director Michael Barnett and my now co-producer Claire Tucker. And both of them had shared that they were interested in telling stories about transgender high school athletes. And working at GLAD, my job is to help advise and consult content creators on how to tell the most authentic and accurate and respectful stories about the trans community. And so I was extremely hesitant uh, when I first heard from these two filmmakers, both of whom who are cisgender and sort of just started asking them questions about, you know, where did they come to this topic from? What was the intention? Um, what did they want to do with these stories? Um, because young trans people are very vulnerable, not just in media, but out in the world with all the legislation that we've seen intensifying over the years. Um, and so I'm also just very protective of trans young people and making sure that they have the agency and ability to consent to their stories and how they're being told. So. The way that I found that Michael and Claire came to this was that someone very near and dear to Michael, uh, a family friend, uh, family friend's child had shared that um, she was transgender and he quickly realized he did not have the tools or the resources to be the ally that he knew he wanted to be in this young child's life for the rest of her life. And so he just started scouring the internet to learn as much as he can. We always talk about self-education as being such a critical form of allyship. And that's really what he did. So it didn't start out as I want to make a film. It was really let me figure out how I can show up for this family and this child. And he came across Mac Begg's story, which at the time was ballooning into a national news story with a lot of controversy surrounding it because a lot of media was picking up on the story without actually talking to Mac or understanding what exactly was going on because it was the policy that didn't allow Mac to wrestle with other boys. So Michael kept doing research and he could not shake Mac's story from his system. Uh, he just, he saw what this 
young teenage boy was having to go through to wrestle, uh, you know, and sports is so universal in so many ways. Uh, we are all, we all come to it in different ways, but there is usually a very emotional attachment to sports that we grew up with. And so uh, after seeing Max story and really not being able to, to rid it from his mind and heart, um, he reached out to me and basically just started asking questions. You know, is there room for stories like this? Should we be the filmmakers to tell it? How would you suggest we go about this? And of course, I shared my honest hesitance about how they were coming to it and the sensitivities that they need to uh, hold very high in mind as they were setting out on this journey. And very quickly, they asked if I would want to produce it and be at that highest level of decision making. And after meeting them, it became very clear what their t intentions are and that they were willing to do as much work as I was willing to do to also unlearn my own discomfort around trans inclusion in sport. So that led us on this four and a half, five year journey. Um, and thank you for, you know, saying what you do about the film app. I don't know that I can, I will ever be as proud of something as I am because for Andrea, Sarah, Terry and Mac, they say we've done them proud um, and done their stories justice. And I don't know if there's a higher compliment for a documentary filmmaker um, to really restore those stories to who they always belonged. Man, I'm getting emotional over here because I rewatched the film this morning in preparation for this conversation. I had seen an earlier cut um, after y'all had finished on the festival circuit and before you went to Hulu and um, watching it again, it just, um, it, it's very touching, especially the parts where you get into the family lives of the athletes and to see trans people who are loved, not because of anything other than these people love them as for who they are as a person. I feel so often in trans representation that we see on screen that it's, you have to be an exceptional trans person to be loved. Um, and while these young athletes are exceptional, it's not their transness that necessarily makes them exceptional. It's, it's the content of their character, so to speak. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think you hit it. And and so often we see the extremes in transgender storytelling. It's either uh, tragedy and trauma or it's exceptional triumph. And so yeah. much life is lived between those extremes. And so it was important to us though, as documentary filmmakers too, to share the truth. And the truth is that there's a lot of in between. There's a lot of gray. There's a lot of um, unexpected. And, you know, a lot of people do ask, you know, what was the motive or choice behind showing all this love and support? And, uh, you know, certainly it was a choice for us to lean in, in some ways to that, but it was also a reflection of reality. Um, I think there's often the misconception that trans people don't have love and support um, when in fact, you know, if it's not already baked into our families or our communities, we, we do tend to go find it for ourselves. And so that's just not often something we see, and yet it very much exists. And what I also appreciate about, you know, the young athletes is that their families are very different. They're not who you might expect would be these staunch allies and champions. And so that representation of the trans young people actually be the, being the hero in their own stories also provides a model of allyship for people who may not know the right words. They may be stumbling with pronouns. They may not have all the right language or the right tools, but grandma Nancy said something that didn't make it into the film you don't have to get it, you just have to go with it. And I think for a lot of people, they are so scared of saying the wrong thing and then end up not saying anything at all. And I hope what the film shows is that we're all fallible to making mistakes. None of us are perfect. Um, 
But as long as we are listening and learning and committing to improving, I mean, that's, that is the kind of love. I think that is so powerful um, and extending that grace for people to grow because, you know, if, if we were all the same person we were at birth, it wouldn't be a very exciting or good or fulfilling life in my opinion. No, and something that I really appreciate about changing the game, and I'm getting emotional again over here because the depiction of grand Grandma Nancy and Max's grandfather specifically gets me in this movie because they are people who don't necessarily get pronouns right all the time, at least in the depiction, at, at least at the time that this was filmed, right? But they are so supportive of Mac, and you know you can see how they fight for him. And the scene where Grandma Nancy runs down the block with Mac gets me every time and as two people who were very close to our own grandmothers um to see that kind of embrace of a trans child um it hits it hits home for me and i think it's a really beautiful depiction of of this idea that you're talking about about how allyship evolves and how maybe you don't have all the answers right now but that doesn't mean, you know, just because you don't have the right language right now doesn't mean that you can't show up for the people in your life. And I think that that message is universal across the board, whether or not you're trans. I mean, for any community, right? Like we are all allies to other communities that we're a part of. I am an ally to the young athletes in the film. I, you know, I did not have that experience as a young trans. I mean, I wasn't out as trans as early as there, which is so amazing for me to watch them be so certain and confident in themselves. Something I wish I had, and I wish I had had them to look to, to, to see that I could, be that and do that for myself but you know again grandma nancy with all the quotes when she's it's funny when we've screened the film for years and years we didn't know if we were going to find distribution and so i never turned down an opportunity to screen it wherever anyone asked for it we will show up we will be there because if one person sees the film it is worth it um but i remember in most screenings uh, whenever Grandma Nancy would say she was going to run with Mac, sometimes we get a laugh and sometimes we get a deep sigh. And I always resonated with the deep sigh because that line, while it is kind of funny, if you're like, oh, Grandma, she's not really going to run. What she says is, you may get there and back before I do, but I'm coming with you. And that is so, I think, symbolic of how we can approach showing up and supporting people in our allyship. Just saying, we're coming on this journey with you. I support you, I'm here, I may not always get it right, but I want to continue to try to. And so that part always gets me very emotional. Again, you know, sometimes you get a laugh, sometimes you get a deep sigh, I'm in the deep right. sigh camp. Um, but I think it's true, I think, you know, part of me in becoming a better person and a better filmmaker is being open to many different perspectives and taking all of those in and respecting them, um, which I am so proud that we were able to do in the, collab the filmmaking collaboration process. Uh, Michael, Claire, and I have ultimate trust and respect for each other, so we were able to have difficult conversations about what makes it on screen and what doesn't. Um, and that wasn't always easy, but we knew we wanted to make a film for everyone. And so that required us to think, okay, what will people resonate with on a more broad scale? And it was surprisingly more difficult than you might imagine to um, really pull back sometimes in our reflexes about what kinds of story pieces to include. But, the collaboration piece is it can't be understated how important that is and in, in making something that you feel really proud of at the end of the day and I always say being willing to win and lose with that team not to use a sports metaphor but sort of always too. <laughs>
Well, filmmaking is a team sport, so I do think that a sports metaphor is more than appropriate here. But speaking of uh, resonating, uh, one of our audience members said that Grandma Nancy is amazing, um, so clearly she is resonating with, with broader audiences, which kind of brings me to my next question, which is, what's been the reception from your perspective? You know, how have people, you know, shown up for this film or been embracing or fighting this film? I'd, I'd love to hear what your experience has been while promoting it. Yeah, I mean, well, I'll start in 2019. So we premiered at Tribeca in 2019, and then we went on a whirlwind of a festival journey. We've been on the festival circuit for a little over two years, I think. And we took it, again, we took it everywhere. Anywhere anyone wanted to see it, we found a way to go there. Um, and the overwhelming reception to my shock and surprise because again culture moves at a very quick pace so in 2019 we were living in a very different time than we're living now we screened in small towns in big cities and red states and blue states uh with older people younger people and the overwhelming majority when they got to actually know these kids the the conversation around policies and legislation sort of dissolved away because it, it was no longer abstract in people's minds that these are young people's lives that are very full and have a lot of love and support and have difficulties and struggles and messiness as we all do, but there's a relatability to it. It should not, I mean, we always say like, Mac, Andrea, Sarah, and Terry are so dang brave. So dang brave for like being themselves unapologetically and continuing to do the things they love despite whether it's legislative barriers or cultural backlash because you saw in Connecticut, the policy was very affirming but that didn't mean that the culture was caught up with that. So, so, I'm not going to cuss, but so freaking brave. And they shouldn't have to be. No one should have to be that brave to be themselves or do what they love. That shouldn't be the kind of society that we live. And so the response is just that when you get to know these young people um, and their full lives and their joys and their not in joys, you relate to them and you want them to succeed and be able to be themselves. And that's been extremely powerful because we have seen minds and hearts opened in 90 minutes. And we've had people come up and apologize uh, for the way they've behaved and reacted to trans people prior to watching the film and then have committed to saying, you know, I, I really owe someone a pol an apology and I'm going to go make that. And so that's why I say I will never turn down an opportunity to share the film because we don't know, just like Grandma Nancy and, and Ghazi and Jen and Tom's love, we don't know whose lives could be changed or saved um, by the stories that we tell and how we tell them. Well, speaking of apologies, a question I had while watching it was, have you heard from any of the people who had, just quite frankly, the audacity to say some of the pretty heinous transphobic things to camera that they did? Have you heard from any of those people? You know, unfortunately, no, because they, a few of them had said they were going to show up to screenings and I've been waiting for them. I've been ready to have conversations with them and tell them about the fact that they are undermining their own equality and liberation and ability to be. Uh, and all of this is rooted, again, I had to go on my own journey to figure out what this is all really about. But I've been waiting for them. Um, but I, I, I do wanna say that um, Andrea had never experienced that kind of brute harassment in, real life she had experienced a lot of it on social media and in media never in that way until the camera showed up so these are people that wanted their opinions to be shared vocalized and the other thing i want to say too is 
some of those people that you see on the track, um, you might assume that they're parents of other kids running, um, but they, some of them were just adults, grown adults who decided to go to a track and bully kids. They didn't even have kids who were, run not to say that that makes any kind of difference, but they went out of their way to go there um, and, and do what they did. And so, you know, it was important for us to show that that is a reality um, and what these young people go through, even when the policies are good, because that doesn't equate to culture change. Um, and, you know, people ask, you know, how did you balance how much of that kind of hate to show? And, and we had difficult conversations about that because the film is a love story. It's, you know, it's not really about that, but it would have been disingenuous and dishonest to not show pieces of what these young people have to endure. And, and I want to note really quickly as well, mm -hmm. you know, these are young people who do have love and support in their lives. Not everyone does, um, but I hope it illustrates for people, even with that kind of love and support, this is what you have to go through and imagine not having that. Um, and we can talk a little more about how we kind of came to these athletes in particular, but I think it's it's really important. There, there were reasons why we chose these young people mm -hmm. um, because we are also very mindful of how the film would affect their lives. Um, and we, we wanted the film to enhance it, not exploit it further, so. It's a shame that these children, at least at the time children, I don't know how old everybody is at this point, but at the time these children are having to not only defend their rights to do what any other child gets to do free of discrimination, but then they're put on a national stage through these broadcasters and news pundits who decide, oh, I'm going to use this as our next political football. I'm going to use this just as entertainment value. And what it does is it affects the real lives of these kids who are just trying to play a sport like any of their peers. I mean, specifically Max, his story <laughs> really blew up. I, I know Andrea and Terry uh, also had a segment on GMA that's shown in the film and everything like that. But how have these kids been able to deal with the media scrutiny of just trying to be themselves or advocate for their rights to play sports? And their right to be. I mean, I think yeah. they just have an immense amount immense amount of resolve mm -hmm. and certainty in who they are. I don't know that you could face this without being so secure in knowing this is me. And, and what I love is they vocalize that. I mean, Sarah does it. She's like, what am I going to do? Detransition? Cause the government, no, I'm going to be myself. This is who I am. I know this is who I am. And I think that's extremely powerful. And I don't know that you find that outside of very personal um, security. And again, the, that kind of love and support that they had, not only in their families, we didn't get to show as much, but also in their teammates. Um, and I want to mention though, you know, Mac's story did blow up in a huge way in ways that we hadn't seen this conversation come to the fore before. But to speak about Andre and Terry, their story was a, in the way that it was taken from them and used against them um, has been a lot more insidious. Um, so, you know, I know there's been, this past legislative session was the worst in LGBTQ in all of our history. And many people who are watching might know if they don't already, the, the majority of the bills tar targeting LGBTQ people were aimed at young trans kids in either withdrawing life-saving healthcare or prohibiting them from playing sports. And it has to be known that all of these lawmakers that keep introducing these bills can't cite local examples in their states of why they are doing this, why they are proposing, why they are putting them forward. The only example they can cite uh, is Andrea and Terry in Connecticut, who by the way, are in college and not running track. Um, 
And we can't disentangle that Mm -hmm. from the sexist and racist notions that we're seeing play out on the Olympic stage. And, And by the way, there is a difference between elite level athletics and the Olympics, the NCAA and elementary, middle and high school sports. Um, but we're seeing that play out on the Olympics level. These attacks on trans kit under the guise of, a t- of you know, protecting girls and women's sports by keeping trans girls and women out is actually about a larger issue of policing what a girl can be, what a woman can be, what a boy can be, what a man can be. And basically putting people in these extremely rigid boxes that most of us are not even going to fit into to begin with, because those expectations are very, very specific. And I, I just like to mention for those people who are dealing with discomfort around this topic, because I also did, even as a trans man, is asking the questions, whose bodies are celebrated? and whose bodies are regulated. So Michael Phelps produces less lactic acid naturally in his body that allows him to do what he does masterfully in the pool. And simultaneously, someone like Simone Biles, who is arguably the greatest athlete of all time, the sport of gymnastics doesn't know how to handle that greatness. So they keep moving the benchmark of success. And we have to ask the questions of, why are those why are those two athletes being treated differently and i think it reveals itself coming back to what happened to andre and terry and that they weren't they didn't win all their races but we only heard about them when they did win and so it begs the question can you be trans and succeed um because that is really when everyone takes issue and that's the dominant narrative that's out there. And so that's why it was really important for us to show Mac and Andrea and Terry, who are exceptional athletes because they train, because they have access to that. kind. I mean, you see Ngazi as like, mm-hmm. I mean, Ngazi is a coach. Like she comes from that DNA of pushing. And to see someone like Sarah, who just love to participate. And that's actually one of my favorite scenes in the film is a bit unexpected, I think. Um, But it has to do with Sarah and just, you know, getting to be herself. And so, you know, balancing all these difficult questions and conversations and understanding that beneath it all are, are real people whose real lives are currently the subject of a lot of debate without a lot of, uh, actual understanding of the broader cultural landscape and and the issues that we're really talking about, which aren't about trans kids. Well, and people seem to don't seem to not understand that it's not going to stop with trans kids when there are all of these legislative pushes to regulate people's genders, right? For example, Castor Semenya, an incredible athlete, an incredible runner, has been dealing with this for almost the last 10 years, maybe more, um, where people are trying to police her womanhood, right? Or what makes a woman? And often these really just affect Black women, um, whether you're trans or not. And so this is all a push for control, not just over trans people, and this affects everybody else. And so when people ask me, they're like, well, why should I care about this? You should care about this because they're coming for you next. It's not just going to end with our community. It's, it's It's a fight for control over what it means to be a person. And if you don't fit these rigid boundaries, as you said... Uh, you are up for policing or retribution in some way. And yeah, so, and I, I just yeah. I will, just wanted to add stuff too. Yeah. You know, that's that's citing at the Olympic level. I mean, we're seeing right. it with a bunch of athletes right now. And then if we look at young kids, right. there have now been instances where the gender nonconformity policing is getting really bad because of these legislation and bills. There was a girl who, not trans, uh, was gender nonconforming. Her hair was too short for somebody. And that uh, caused her team to be banned from playing because 
to gender non-conforming don't know what to do with that. Um, and so, you know, to your point, people should care, not only because this is about individual autonomy, um, but also that when you understand all of these different issues that hopefully we can stand up for people, not just when our interests are at stake or when we have skin in the game, um, but because it's the right thing to do. And when we're, especially when we're talking about kids, it, it, I don't get into the Olympic NCAA because I am sure. a storyteller. I'm a media guy. I leave the policy and legislation to people who do that work. I'm wearing an ACLU t-shirt. Like they, they know <laughs> what they're doing. Um, but when it comes to kids, you know, we're going to build a better society when kids are able to be and express themselves without fearing the judgment and the punishment, mm -hmm. which creates toxic masculinity, that creates this society of harassment and bullying, where if you don't fit into a certain mold, uh, you are going to feel the effects of that. And so I think it's, you know, hopefully people are not only invested because they will be impacted if they haven't already been, they are implicated, but also that it's the right thing to do. And I think we, we make a better society when we show up, not just when it's convenient or when it affects us, but um, we all are affected. I mean, that's the thing, like all of us are affected because we coexist together in our communities. And so I hope, and I've been heartened to see that there are coalitions, especially of feminist and women communities understanding the root of what this is about and uh, not taking it. Well, to turn the attention back to you for a second as a storyteller, um, I'm sure we'll get into this much more in a bit, but you know, you're also uh, a producer on Disclosure, which is a groundbreaking documentary that if you haven't seen it, audience at home, please watch it. It's on Netflix. It is one of the most important documentaries I constantly recommend for people who want to understand more about trans people. Um, it's all about the history of trans lives on screen from the beginning of cinema all the way up until uh, 2020 when it was released. And Alex is a producer uh, on that movie. And so I'm wondering, Alex, how did your work on Disclosure prepare you for these conversations that you're having around changing the game? Or what did you learn from that movie that you were able to carry with you um, through the process of making Changing the Game, even though you started making Changing the Game before Disclosure? I mean, the learning and education that came from working on Disclosure is immeasurable. Um, director Sam Fader and executive producer Laverne Cox from from beginning to end, there was intention and thought behind how the production model would look, which was prioritizing hiring trans people in crude roles, paying everyone who appeared on screen, paying people who were in the fellowship, who were, you know, providing that opportunity so that these stories that are told about us are by us. The disability community has an amazing phrase that I borrow all the time, nothing about us without us. And they've now shortened that to nothing without us because we are a part of every community, uh, every time period, every culture. And I think disclosure in the production model and how it was made um, was one of the just best models of putting in that work, that nothing is impossible if you're committed to the mission of what you say you are going to do. And I borrowed a lot of that for changing the game. So like when I was on set for Disclosure, Sam would be interviewing, um, whoever was sitting in the hot seat. And we had everyone behind the, the camera listening in on, on the earpiece. And I will never forget um, 
I'll, I'll say her name here because she, you know, Nava Mao, who is now on Generation on HBO Max, which if you haven't watched, you definitely should. She's an, an incredible actress, uh, filmmaker, producer. And I remember that I forget who we were interviewing, but she called me aside and she's like, hey, you know, I think there's a real opportunity here to go down this level of questioning. Um, so I, I think if, if we can pivot and do this kind of, and so I walkied Amy, the producer of Disclosure and Sam, and I said, Nava, I think has a really great idea. What if we go on this journey of questioning for this person and see where we can go with that? And, you know, it's that kind of openness and collaboration that leads to the best results. Um, and being able to source different opinions and have buy-in and guidance from different people and perspectives because you're bringing people onto your production because they're good at what they do and they have something valuable to bring. And uh, that's what we did for Changing the Game too. I actually had Nava watch the film in very early cuts and I was like, give it to me. Whatever notes you have, whatever feedback, I wanna hear them. And I did that for quite, I mean, if you look at the thank you credits of Changing the Game, it's list upon list upon list of advocates, activists, grassroots, people on the ground in different states, uh, working at community organizations. And while not all the feedback was obviously going to be incorporated, it was all so valuable because then you're seeing where different people are reacting and responding to different parts and making sure that, you know, I, if anyone understands that a story that we're telling does not just enter into culture on its own, it enters into a collection and a history of others, you know, we have a responsibility as storytellers to do that work of understanding the context and knowing that our independent work uh, is not more important than how it adds into the conversation. Um, and so well, we were very mindful and sensitive about making sure that nothing that was in the film uh, would put anyone in more harm's way. Um, that included the athletes, that included anyone who, who had attached their name um, and just being, you know, acknowledging that as a creative, as a filmmaker, your responsibility is not only to the project, it's to the communities who you are purporting to represent it's to understanding the collection of other stories that exist and the culture with which your story is entering into. And, and we did not take that responsibility lightly, nor did anyone on the disclosure team. Well, and let's get into that a little more because prior to producing, most of your career has been in communications, working at the LA LGBT Center, Grindr, PBS SoCal, and famously uh, GLAAD as the associate director of trans representation over there. So, I mean, how did that, how did those experiences really contribute to your role as a producer and how you wanted to, you know, not only talk about the film, but how you, you know, were editing the film? Ooh, Sav, you looked into my life story. Um, <laughs> I will start by saying that when I first started working at the LA LGBT Center, this was before Caitlyn Jenner shared her truth with the world. And I just happened to be a trans person in the communications marketing department. And, um, you know, at when Caitlyn Jenner did share her truth with the world, there were all then sorts of media that were ready to talk to any trans person that they could find. Um, and I was very, I recognized that I didn't know enough to speak about anything. And so for the next few months, I sat back and listened to the community, to people I knew who were out doing this work for years and years ahead of me. Um, and I don't think there's been any more important work for me than listening. Um, and if I don't know something that I don't go speak about it, uh, I send them to other people doing that work more expert. I always make the joke, like I would never hire a dentist to do a veterinarian's job. I would never just call on a random 
person to speak on something that they don't have that background or expertise in because that becomes tokenization. That's not actually people contributing in ways that are authentic to who they are. And so my career has been guided by listening to people who know more and being thoughtful and critical about every decision that I make that in regards to my work or as a person. And I have been uh, so um, gifted in the mentorship I've had of people that are willing to share with me who respect that I have my own visions and, and ways of seeing the world and um, investing in me as a person, in my career. Nick Adams, the director of transgender representation has been at GLAAD for over 20 years. He's an unsung hero in storytelling. I mean, most of the great trans character or even good trans characters you've seen in TV and film, there's like a 99% chance Nick has had some hand in that. Um, you know, and, and my, my good friend, Brian Michael Smith, like when I, I didn't, I never gave up on changing the game, but when it looked all but certain that we were never going to be seen outside of the festival circuit, uh, he and other people just encouraged, said, you don't give up on something that you believe in. Like you find a way, you do not give up. And so in so many ways, I've been channeling the athletes from the film in that way. And, you know, even you, Sav, like we have a very close personal relationship outside of our creative professional. And those, that is, that's love and support that you need to be your best self. And, and also people that are willing to call you out and forward, not usually out, hopefully calling in and forward, but I take it as the highest compliment when there are people who know more than me or who know more than me about their own experience who will actually say, hey, actually, you know, maybe consider from this angle or that's not exactly right because then they're telling you that they believe more of you and have confidence that you can get to a, a better, more evolved place and that you will receive what they're sharing. And so, you know, I hope that everybody uh, can have that bit of grace to grow um, and be open to that growing because I, I feel like I'm a better person for these films that I've been able to be a part of. Um, and I just want to share that with other people. Um, I don't know if that answered your question. I'm, I don't speak in sound bites despite what my job is at GLAAD, unfortunately. Um, uh, you cracked me up, man. Um, but that was a very, it, it did not specifically address how Grinder impacted changing the game, unfortunately. But I will take your answer as very genuine. I can't, I can speak to that. Oh, I mean, I was joking, but if you All want right. to. Yeah. No, 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 we have other things. We, can, we have other things. Well, let's pivot back to the movie for a second. Um, how did you pick the athletes you picked to showcase in this film? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, at the time, around like 2017, 2018, um, there weren't a lot of out trans athletes, um, but we sourced networks. So Chris Mosier, is an executive producer on the film. He has a broad network of athletes because a lot of people look up to him as being a Team USA athlete. Um, so he did a lot of that outreach. We connected with different organiz LGBTQ organizations that work with youth and families to see if there were any young people who wanted to share their stories. And again, we are living in a very different time. You see in the film, like it is not easy to be out. There is all but every reason not to be because of the scrutiny and the spotlight that will be forced onto you. Um, but we did end up finding some young people and we had actually filmed with about seven athletes total. Um, and as we were collecting all the footage, we were editing together, there were a number of considerations. So it was one, 
We wanted to sh show the different policies across the country. Um, so we were looking at kids who were in their families who were experiencing different policies and how to navigate those. As you'll see, New Hampshire was very different from Connecticut, very different from Texas. But ultimately, for Mac and Andrea, it was really about returning their stories to them. Their stories had been wildly hijacked and exploited and used against them, and they weren't getting to actually share their own experiences from their own perspective. So that was our priority. And then um, with Sarah, uh, when you meet her, she just lights up the screen. You just can tell that this is someone who will have her life enhanced by a bigger platform. And for some of the other athletes who we decided not to include, we had different, we had really difficult conversations about will this film add to their life or will it make it harder, more vulnerable, less safe? Um, and it ultimately came down to, I mean, you know, there's no denying, I always say that Sarah reminds me of like mini AOC, like she is going to benefit from a bigger platform. And for some of the other athletes, we felt that the platform and the spotlight would maybe not make their lives better. Um, and so we made those really difficult decisions after filming with them for quite some time, but ultimately, you know, making that decision as the creatives and the decision makers to do what's in the best interest of the athletes. Um, and ultimately, I think, you know, I couldn't imagine the film being in any other way without these three young people. And it just so happened that Terry entered into the picture as we were filming. And that is just one of those examples of the power of representation, not just on screen, but in life. When you mm -hmm. see someone who you can relate to, who you can find your experience and identity in, the possibility then of expanding the visions of who you can be because someone out there exists. Um, and that's what Andrea did for Terry. And we just happened to capture that lightning in a bottle moment that happens all the time. Um, but we don't often get to, you know, be there with a camera to see. It was one of my favorite parts of the movie to see that because I think as trans people, we know this experience of, you know, either somebody comes out and that gives us permission to come out or you come out and then suddenly, you know, you start noticing people around you start coming out because, you know, there is a ripple effect with, you know, being able to, to feel that comfort within yourself or see other people that they're fine when they come out. Because I think, and Disclosure touches, touches on this, and you touch on this a lot in your work, but when you only see negative portrayals of what happens when you come out as trans, that's what you feel is going to happen. You internalize that message. And so I think this documentary is going to have an even bigger impact in that it's going to make other trans kids feel like they can play sports and, you know, there's already somebody who's set a path for them. They have a, a possibility for their future because they know that somebody else has already gone through this. Yeah, I mean, that is the the hope and we've started seeing that already and again like I, I also want to you know talking about autonomy you know um a lot of times these young people are labeled as activists uh without assigning that label or describing or defining themselves that way and I mm -hmm. think it's what's really exciting is seeing the broadening definitions of advocacy and activism um, and owning the labels that you want to have for yourself. Um, because simply wanting to be able to live safely and freely as yourself doesn't mean you call yourself an activist. That just means that you, you think people should have equality and acceptance for being who they are. And I think that's also a big, important part of the work that I do is expanding representation, again, not only on screen, but off screen. So because mm -hmm. when I was growing up, I saw Boys Don't Cry. And that was the only vision for the future I have for what kind of life I was going to live, which if you know that movie, it doesn't provide much hope 
or possibility for the future. And then when I would look at news media or other sorts of media, I would only see trans people as activists in the street. And I'm a short guy. Like if I go into any crowd, I, I can't see anything. I'm not going to make really much of an effect. So I didn't even have a notion of how I could contribute in society in a positive way. And I think that to me is also what's really exciting about just showing up and being yourself. Sav, as you said, you've, you've seen that effect. Showing up, being yourself often authentically, not trying to fit into the other molds of what you think has already been done or how people have done it, but knowing who you truly are and leaning into that and contributing where you are fired up and passionate because I love storytelling and I love educating. I, you know, hopefully one day I will be a teacher in an official capacity, but seeing trans people getting to occupy these positions that are actually fulfilling and not just because they've been forced into one specific notion of who you have to be and how you can be celebrated or valued in that way. Um, that's really exciting for me because if you look at Andrea, Sarah, Terry, and Mac, they're totally different people. They are so wildly different in who they are and how they take up the activist mantle if they even describe it that way. Um, so representation, again, when we're talking about it, I'm talking about it in a very broad way, in a, you know, you meet your barista or your accountant or your dentist or your veterinarian and being able to see the, and the, I'm all talking about occupations, but this could exist in every sort of way in, in terms right. of family dynamics and neighbors, just getting to see a bunch more different people being succeeding, thriving, still struggling, because we all do, as ourselves, and being able to see yourself among the constellation and find an easier path to shoot for those stars, not to be cliche or cheesy, but, you know, that's who I am. Well, what now what can people do after watching Change in the Game or watching this conversation, perhaps people are feeling a certain type of way. They're feeling moved. They're feeling like their mind has changed. They're feeling like they want to be part of the solution. What do you recommend people go out and do? Well, if you've watched Changing the Game, tell other people to watch it. If you haven't, please watch it. Um, because we have seen, and Sav, I'm, I know you know this, that storytelling has the capability of doing that kind of culture change, of shifting and opening hearts and minds in ways that sometimes these kind of conversations don't. Sometimes they do, which is awesome. I hope that someone takes something away from our conversation, but I don't think there's a better substitute than actually seeing people's lives play out and empathizing and feeling and rooting for them to really change you. Um, and then beyond that, you know, what I always call for with allies um, is we need people to have difficult conversations on our behalf sometimes with us because a lot of times trans people are doing this labor of saying, here's how to understand these issues. Here's how, like, please understand this affects you. And what we need are allies who, if you hear something that is homophobic or transphobic or racist or sexist, take it upon yourself if you can. And if you are not uh, put in danger, if your safety is not compromised, if, if it is not too emotionally taxing for you, um, to have that difficult conversation because it should not always fall on people who are marginalized to step up and be defending. And, you know, I think we do live in a culture right now that um, it's easy to write off people who say a certain thing or have a certain political or ideological system that's attached to that. We see that in changing the game. But if we write off every single person for having a difference of some kind and we don't have allies 
meeting people where they are and pulling them forward as I've had the great benefit of having in my own personal growth and evolution, we are going to continue being polarized and separated. And we're not going to have these com- these difficult, uncomfortable conversations that can actually connect people and help us all in our growth and evolution. And so looking at changing the game is an example of, you know, you may have written off someone like Grandma Nancy because of her political ideological beliefs. And maybe we need to see people more holistically and understand that not everyone has certain exposure to communities, has certain access to education and vocabulary. These are issues of class that we don't often talk about. Um, So if you can be a person to do that, if you can be like my grandma Sheila or grandma Nancy in supporting by living and doing, that can often mean more than posting on social media. It's the work behind the scenes that's often, you know, underpraised. That's the kind of culture work that you can shift and change people's lives, sometimes without knowing it, but you don't need to know it to feel good about it. And that's sort of a Grandma Nancy quote that I guess I'll leave us with. Well, speaking of Grandma Nancy, I do want to talk about this idea of being stubbornly independent, uh, which is the motto of the Tallgrass Film Festival, who is hosting this conversation we're having. Um, Alex, stubbornly independent is the Tallgrass motto. It's been for as long as the festivals existed. And I like to think that you have to be a little bit stubbornly independent to do all of the things that you've been able to accomplish so far um, and to you know, persevere as an independent filmmaker. So we'd love to know, what does that mean to you? What does it mean for you to be stubbornly independent? That means uh, I am extremely stubbornly independent, especially as a Sagittarius as well. Add that on and it's, it's a combo. But um, having people who see that stubborn independence and know that that's a part of the process and accept and support through that. It's not always easy being a friend or a partner or family member to people who are stubbornly independent and persistent, but their love that's unconditional um, makes it possible because this is, this work is collaborative. It's collective. It is while we can be stubbornly independent, if we're not inviting people into the process, we're not going anywhere. We got to get there together. Well, as a fellow Sagittarius and somebody whose birthday is one day apart from you, I completely <laughs> agree with you there, my friend. Um, I want to thank you for spending this time with us today. And I want to encourage everybody who's watching, if you haven't seen Changing the Game, please go watch it through Pride Grass. Uh, please watch it. Tell your friends to watch it after Pride Grass on Hulu. Um, and if you're interested in supporting independent film, please uh, consider supporting the Tallgrass Film Festival. If you would like to support trans creatives uh, who would like to tell their own stories, consider making a donation to the Transgender Film Center. We're a 501c3 organization that provides artist support to trans people um, who are telling their own stories, um, which is is vital. It's so important for us to be able to have control over our own narratives, as Alex alluded to earlier, um, by borrowing the phrase, nothing without us from the disability community. Um, I wanna thank everybody for joining the us for this conversation. Please, Alex, can you tell people where to find you and support you on social media? Thank you, Sav. And I just want to say too, uh, please do support the Transgender Film Center. It's an incredible organization that is supporting emerging filmmakers. I'm a big fan and supporter of it uh, and my friend Sav here. And I just wanted to thank Tallgrass for hosting us, for inviting Changing the Game. You can find me on social media at Anderfin, A-N-D-E-R-F-I-N-N, and then definitely check out uh, Changing Game Doc on all the social platforms. It's myself and my uh, social impact manager, Shane Diamond, 
who is a trans man athlete himself. Uh, and we are looking to bring the film, these conversations to anyone, everyone, everywhere who wants to have it. Thank you so much again, Alex. I'm such a fan of you. I adore you. I'm so glad that we were able to have this conversation today. Thank you for Shane for making Alex's life easier on this impact tour. Um, and thank you to everybody at the Tallgrass Film Festival and anybody who joined us today for this conversation. Have a great one and uh, trans lives matter, black trans lives matter, all black trans lives matter, all black lives matter, all of the things. Um, and, and please uh, make life easier for a trans person by watching Disclosure by Alex and changing the game. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone.